All right, it's great to see so many on our little but beautiful studio stage. And I'm happy to present our first speaker over here, who prefers to be ca called Mimi, actually, but that's about the extent I know about him because I'm not prepared at all. Uh, but I heard someone else here on stage could tell us a bit about Mimi. Yeah, when I was a code baby, I had written a single line of code ever. I was 23. Um, I started working for Punkte E, and he was a very, very good teacher and very patient. And now I'm really hoping that he hasn't lost that in the years that I haven't seen him. And um, we're ready for your talk, Mimi. Thank you. Are you ready? I hope so. Are you ready? Cool. Thank you for the nice introduction. Maybe we can switch the slides. <laughs> okay, so just to make sure you're in the right talk, we want to talk about CICD, which is not corporate identity, corporate design, but continuous integration and continuous delivery for cloud infrastructure. So um, first I want to know a little bit about you. Who of you is deploying their application, website, whatever, into the cloud? Okay, quite a few people. Uh, who of you is using Terraform for that? Okay, less people, so maybe we do a bit more introduction to that concept. Yeah, a quick, a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. So first of all, I want to do a quick recap on what continuous integration and continuous delivery actually is about. And then I want to introduce you very quickly to a concept that we call the infrastructure stack, which is quite a foundation of the things I will then present afterwards, um, which will focus a bit on testing infrastructure code and then finally how to design a pipeline around this. Um, last but not least, I want to talk a little bit about the challenges, what makes infrastructure code or handling infrastructure different to application code. And at the end, hopefully provide you a good two-slide summary as the takeaway of this presentation. But let's step in. Who of you is doing continuous integration for whatever things? Cool, cool, cool. That's nice to see. That's really great. But anyway, let's quickly recap what this is about. So a continuous integration development process usually starts with a developer checking out the recent code base. This should be something like git pull. Yeah? Once you have the recent revision of the code on your machine, what you usually do is you implement a change. This can be a new feature, a bug fix, whatever. Ideally, for continuous integration, this would happen in very small batches. You only want to make very small changes. Once you did that, you want to make sure that you have the last update from remote, merge this back in, and run what we call a local build to get a first feedback whether your feature or your change works as expected. And then you send all this off to your CI pipeline. The CI pilot then usually runs a build, test, and maybe something like a development deployment. And this step, but also the run a local build step, requires a very good safety net of automated tests. This is what makes continuous integration effective, because if you just run a build and don't get feedback whether some tests actually work, you might have poor confidence in whether the code does what you actually expect it to do. What you get out of this first part of this continuous integration part is a package that we want to call the potentially deployable artifact. So it's a version of your code from which you are pretty sure that if you want, you could deploy it. That's the first part. Very, very important. If you do not integrate all your code changes at least once a day, what you do is what we call CI theater. It's running some scripts on a CI server, but it's not continuous integration. So the core idea of continuous integration, and this is really important to understand, is that you do this, that you integrate all the changes at least once a day. This is what gives you the confidence that your changes still work. Okay? Remember this, please. Then let's look into continuous de delivery, which is kind of the follow-up process. So you take this potentially deployable artifact, and you have an automated deployment, usually first to some staging environment. So you don't want to go directly into production. Some people do it. But usually you have, first of all, some non-production staging environment in which you deploy your code and can run it in a production-like environment. 
you can have acceptance testing, which is automated testing on top of it, but you can also do something like user acceptance testing or exploratory testing. This depends, okay? But last but not least, you have this final step of deploying the thing to production. Some people prefer to have kind of a manual approval here. So this means someone has to click the button to say, yes, this thing goes into production. But what's very important is that this whole thingy is automated, yeah, painless and easy to repeat and easily reproducible. OK, but now we talk about infrastructure, right? So the big question might be, why should I do continuous integration, continuous delivery for my infrastructure code? I have it automated in some Terraform scripts, and I have a Confluence page where I have those five commands ready that I need to run to deploy my infrastructure. Now, this is actually a literal quote from some of our Teams chats. <laughs> this happened at a client, and it was a thought worker. That's why I thought I can quote it here. So. What happened is that someone messed up this Terraform deployment with a different version run locally than what we used to run in the pipeline. And the end of the story was that Terraform tried to recreate all the infrastructure. You can imagine what this means, right? This could have led to a severe outage if the person wouldn't have carefully read what's in the log output. And the problem is, and we will come to that in a second, Without a proper automation, you don't do infrastructure as code right. Yeah? You only do the first part, you only do the coding part, but you don't do the automation part. And that's why I think it's super important to have a well-defined automated process around it that's reliable and easily to process. If you go a bit deeper and read a book from a colleague of mine, Keith Morris, I don't know who of you knows him, he wrote this Infrastructure as Code book at O'Reilly, which I think is kind of the standard book for, for in Infrastructure as Code. He says the three core principles of Infrastructure as Code are, first of all, and I guess you all do that, everything should be code. This means it's not only the scripts that describe your infrastructure, it's also the tests around it, it's the configuration, it's the pipeline, and important, it's also the automation scripts. Then to do infrastructure as code right, you should continuously test and deliver the work in progress. Remember this first step when I say you should do your changes in small batches? Yeah, you should not only do the change in small batches, you should also test and deploy it in small batches because the smaller the change, the less likely an error and the easier to understand what went wrong if something went wrong. Um, this testing is also what we call build quality in, which means we try to shift the idea of, of testing your change as much to the left in the development process as possible. And we try to test as we work. This means ideally we would get the first feedback of the tests already on the developer workstation and not very late when the production deployment happens. And again, this idea of integrating at least daily. And last but not least, and this is very, very important, you should slice your infrastructure code into very, very small pieces because this, again, reduces the complexity of your stacks. I will introduce that in a minute. And you will get shorter feedback cycles. Because if you run Terraform with 1,000 resources, this will take, I don't know, 20 minutes. If you run it with 10 resources, it's rather fast, and you get a very quick feedback. You can also apply proper permission boundaries, which is very important for cloud infrastructure. So the principle of, of least privilege should be applied here. And the smaller you slice your, your infrastructure code, the less privileges you need for a person or a system who is allowed to execute this towards your cloud provider API. And the last thing, and we'll talk about this at the end again, you can thereby reduce the blast radius, which is the potential thing that can go wrong if things go wrong, right? Some more motivation why you should automate the infrastructure deployment is it's really easy with infrastructure code to create what we call snowflake environments. So you know snowflakes yeah, from a far distance, they all look the same, and the closer you get, the more differences you spot. Yeah, the same easily happens to infrastructure. So from, from a distance, your dev, staging, and production environment might all look the same, but there are those nasty details that might differ, and that can easily bring you in trouble. Um, or the related to this is 
you should try to avoid configuration drift. And one way to do this is that there is one way and one way only to apply changes. This reduces the chance of accidentally introducing differences. And last but not least, uh, it's usually very important to have a proper audit log to, to figure out who did what, not to blame anybody, but for example, to have a point of contact if things went wrong uh, and you want to try to figure out what happened there. Yeah? So if you have one well-defined process, it's very easy to get a proper audit log. If you have to chase down changes executed by someone on their local workstation, it's really tricky, if not impossible, to track those changes and the execution of the changes. If you're doing continuous integration, you can also say what you want to provide to your developers is this familiar workflow of writing code, committing your changes, and pushing, and you are done. Yeah. Hopefully, with your automation done right, this is all you need to do for application code. We want to have the same workflow for infrastructure code. OK, I talked a little bit about this infrastructure stack. Now, what is it? Hopefully, as a responsible developer, product owner, whatever person involved in software development, you always look at things from the business side. So with whatever code you write, application you develop, or feature you introduce, you want to support a business. You want to support a company making money with your software. So this is the starting point of all our observation or discussion. Those are the green boxes at the top. Yeah? Whatever it is, this is what your company makes money with. So underneath those business capabilities, you usually have kind of an abstraction layer, and this might differ from application to application. But if you run in the cloud, you usually have some kind of abstraction layer that allows you to be really fast with the development of these business capabilities. And this orange layer is what we want to focus on. And the question is, how do you design and slice this orange layer to best support your developers? Because you there might be some full-stack developers in, in the crowd here. I talked to at least one of you, and I know he's, he has a pretty, a pretty uh, broad knowledge on those things, but usually developers tend to focus on one thing and do that very well, and most developers don't want to get too much in touch with infrastructure. Yeah? So you try to provide a proper abstraction here. And the big question is, how can you slice this ab abstraction in such a way that you can achieve those goals that I mentioned before, which is having small in individual pieces, independent pieces, that you can deploy or provision individually without introducing too much dependency. So software developers usually talk about loose coupling. And the way we usually do it is by figuring out what are small independent pieces of infrastructure that I can deploy and manage in isolation. So one example would be deploying a Kubernetes cluster with the according node groups and a load balancer in front of it. Another example would be a simple key vault, which is a, a secret store in the cloud with the roles and permissions around it to make sure that only the, the right people can access the right credentials. And a third example would simply be a virtual private network that can evolve independently of all those other things and might be a foundation that you create once and then never ever touch again. And it's quite tricky to find good boundaries for these stacks, but it's also super important that you can slice them as small as possible to uh, be able to develop and deploy them in independent units. Do you think you get this concept? Or did you? Yeah? Cool, cool. Because this is important to understand. OK, now that we know how to properly slice our infrastructure code and why we slice it, let's talk a little bit about how we can test it. Because I mentioned before that automated testing is this very important safety net that you want to have in your continuous integration pipeline to make sure that if the pipeline passes, uh, your code is ready to be deployed. Yeah? And you do that by automating your tests. So what we see people do sometimes is writing tests similar to this. So you have a code that provisions a piece of infrastructure. In this case, it's a subnet, but it doesn't matter too much. It's declarative code. There is no, there's no variables. There's no control structures. This is just YAML at its best. And 
hopefully you can rely on the infrastructure framework like Terraform that it's well tested and it does what it's supposed to do. And what the according test is doing is mainly repeating what the code is telling you in forms of a test. So what do you test here? You test the framework. So you're doing the job of well-paid developers at HashiCorp. I trust them. I think they're doing a good job. They test this stuff. You don't need to test it again. So at the end, this test doesn't add much value. Yeah? It doesn't do more than what Terraform itself is already doing. So we need to think about, OK, how can we write more valuable tests, tests that give us better feedback, or test things that the framework cannot test? And to discuss about this, I would like to reintroduce, I hope you all know this, the testing pyramid, the idea of the testing pyramid, which in application testing, you have a lot of unit tests. They run really quickly, have a well-defined scope, give you very, very specific feedback, what went wrong, if things went wrong. And on top of that, you have some integration tests. You bring different units together. The scope gets a bit broader, the feedback a bit fuzzier. It's not that specific anymore. Integration tests are usually also harder to write and a bit more brittle. And on top of all of that, you have a small portion of what we call those journey tests. So they do not only test a, a single function or a class in isolation, but they really step through your application and, and follow along what we call a user journey. So for example, a login workflow would be such a journey. Yeah? They open your website, put in the credential, and see whether you can log in. That would be a classic journey test. But those tests are sometimes hard to write, have a very broad scope, because they go through all your stack. And if you get the feedback, the user can't log in, you know it's broken, but you rarely know what is broken. So the feedback becomes pretty fuzzy. Still, the tests have a certain value, because they test what the user faces. So the question is, how can we translate this into infrastructure? First of all, we realized that with declarative infrastructure frameworks like Terraform, Ansible, and yeah, Pulumi is a bit different because it uses an actual programming language, but at least with the tools that use a declarative language, unit tests are of little value. They usually do what I showed in the previous slide and repeat testing the framework. So we replace unit tests with something we call offline tests. Those are tests that you can run without actually talking to the cloud provider. They are super fast, they are super cheap, no infrastructure is created, and you can even run them locally on your machine. Then on top of that, and that brings back the idea of the stack that I introduced before, we try to have some online tests now talking to the cloud provider or a, a local mock that actually spin up this stack and you can imagine if the stack is really huge, then again, the feedback you get from those tests is very unspecific. But the smaller the stack, the more specific you can get the feedback, OK? And then on very top, yeah, we call it service tests, because a service is usually composed of multiple stacks. So to give you an example, in the cloud, you usually have something like permissions, you have services or resources talking to each other. Those permissions define which resource is allowed to talk to which other resource or which user is allowed to use a resource in a specific way. And think about deploying a database where you have a user and a password and some permissions what this user is allowed to do in this database. And you want to store these this credentials in some credential vault. Then such a service test might be I pick username and password from this credential store log into my database, run an SQL query, and see whether the user is allowed what it's supposed to be allowed, OK? That would be one such a service test. And this test then really adds value, because even if every resource is properly provisioned by your framework, it doesn't mean that they play together as intended. So with such tests, we add value. Yeah? We get a more specific or a different kind of feedback than what the framework can provide us. OK, this is very theoretical. I try to make it a little bit more practical later on. Stay tuned. Another perspective to look at testing is what we call the Swiss cheese testing model. Are you familiar with that? Have you heard this before? I think it's a very nice analogy. So if you know Swiss cheese, it has this rather huge holes. You are a Swiss cheese expert now, Maya, yeah? But if you, if you add enough slices of Swiss cheese behind each other, then you get kind of a solid thing, right? 
the holes kind of vanish when you try to look through it. And this is kind of the same thing we try to apply to our infrastructure uh, provisioning, because we assume that each type of test still leaves some holes, and we want to be prepared for that. So we know that things slip through offline tests. They are very fast, but they don't cover all the things we want to test. Then again, the online stack tests test only the stacks in isolation. So when it comes to how they play together, there are again holes in our testing. Also, integration testing leaves some holes. And at the end, some of the risks we might face in the cloud, they will hit production. And we want to be prepared for that, for example, by proper monitoring, so that at least we, as a provider of a service, are aware of a problem <laughs> before our user is made aware of it. Right. So this is like the, the last layer of defense. And the idea of infrastructure testing is that you add all those layers together to be prepared for something hitting production and reducing the um, probability of this happening. OK? Cool. Now, again, back to the stack idea. Yeah? So we have this individual small stacks. Our usual example is the Kubernetes cluster, but that might be already quite a huge thing. But you can also think about, uh, you mentioned the Postgres database before, so if you want to deploy NEOS to the cloud in the future, at some point you might want to provision a Postgres database in whatever cloud provider you use. Um, this Postgres resource alone might not help you. You need some permission configuration, you need backup in place, you might need some firewall networking configuration to, to manage access to this database. And this thingy, yeah, this Postgres database, together with the add-on configuration that allows you to run NEOS on it, this is what you could imagine as one stack. So now the question is, how can you test such a stack? And, and our idea, and this is very basic to this uh, presentation or this talk, you have this one code base for the stack from which you factor out all configuration. So this is just the plain recipe to bring such a database into your environments. With this code, you can run some local tests. You can do linting. You can agree upon some code styles. You can check whether there are any undeclared variables in it. All this thing happens locally, offline, super fast, pre-commit hook, five seconds, done. Yeah. And then you go in this, um, in this pipeline idea, come to that later, and run the other tests. And the problem is, the closer you get to production, the slower it will be, and potentially the more expensive it will be. Um, so we try to shift the feedback, again, as much to the left as possible by running the fast things first and the slower tests later on, and also the more expensive things later on. But it's important that it's always the same code base that you pass through those changes so that you have as little as possible differences between the individual stages, and it boils down to the configuration of the stack, which you cannot avoid as a difference, right? So the IP range of your production environment will be different from your integration environment, the DNS names, whatever. Yeah? There are small differences, but you try to factor them out as much as possible, keep them as small as possible, and again, gain confidence by passing the same code base through the individual stages. A bit more details to the offline testing, static code analysis, and um, I think it's called local stack from AWS that allows you to reproduce some of the cloud API locally are tools that we usually use for that. They are super cheap. They are super fast. Um, the feedback is, yeah, linting, static code checks. You know what you get from it. Um, first step towards um, this promotion of the code. And you can run them both, as I mentioned, as a pre-commit hook and then later on as a um, mandatory step in your pipeline. Online testing. Now, for the first time, we actually spin up our code. We talk to the cloud provider API. We make sure that whatever Terraform version we use is compatible. The providers work as expected. The configuration of the resources work as expected. Um, and we can actually ins inspect the resource running in the cloud. This is slow to set up and also slow to run. And it's usually costly because it reproduces all your setup. So normally, depending on how long it takes, you try to spin it up and tear it down so that you don't cause uh, too much costs. But again, at least if you tear it down every time, this will require quite some time to execute. So what is our recommendation to get the 
optimal feedback loop is combining those two types of tests, as I mentioned before. First, writing the offline tests, very quick, fast feedback. Then going into the online tests later on in the pipeline so that you can kind of catch the, the easiest bugs early on. And again, the smaller the stacks, the faster those tests will be. And also, the more specific the feedback will be. Yeah, Remember that. Now let's talk about how you actually bring all this into a pipeline, because that's what we wanted to talk about here. I repeat this idea of factoring out configuration from the actual stack code. So this means you have the very same code base for each environment every time ex executed with a different configuration. You can keep both in version control. You should keep both in version control, but the code is one thing, and the configuration is another thing. The code is the same for every environment, or you see from this side. Yeah? The configuration differs. The idea is keep this part that differs from environment to environment as small as possible, and make sure that you test the very same code base in every environment. Um, puzzling this a bit more together, the pipeline might or will have something we call a build stage at the beginning. And the build stage is a little bit different than what you know from application development. So I don't know who of you is actually working with a language that gets compiled into some kind of binary. PHP is an interpreted language. This means you do not really produce a binary unless it's this uh, hip hop thingy still a No, it's not, no longer thing. So OK, back at my time, this was very this was fashion, yeah. Now it seems out fashion, but okay. So you usually have only a, a directory structure of scripts. You don't produce a binary. When we talk about build stage here, what we mean is we have our infrastructure code, we have the tests, we have the binary for Terraform, and we have providers, which is like a plugin concept for, for Terraform. And those things. Um, might differ over time. So you will start using a different version of Terraform. You will use different versions of those plugins. But for reproducibility, you want to make sure that you package all this in, a, in an archive. And this is then your package. This is the outcome of this build stage, right? And with this package, you go through the stages. So a good test whether you do it right is, do you need to download any additional resources from the internet after this build stage? If you need to do so, you are probably doing it wrong. If you can rely on only the content of this package, this looks good, OK? And then you pass those things again through the environments, running the tests that we mentioned before. For local tests, we, can, we usually use something like Terraform Lint or Open Policy Agent. Do you know Open Policy Agent or the concept of policies? OK, then it's maybe a little tricky to introduce it here, but you can, you can define some let's say, boundaries of what you're allowed to do in the cloud. So a very simple example would be your uh, company only allows to provision resources in a certain region. So whenever someone comes along and tries to provision a resource in another region, you can figure that out with such a policy, and the policy will prevent this from happening even before you try to do that, OK? So it's not it gets spun up and then tear down again. It's like you can't do it. This is what policies are for. You can, of course, check some technical correctness long before you run the code. It's a very basic thing. Yeah, this is those things that you usually get with the red line in your IDE. Um, and yes, as I mentioned, security and compliance checks can run in this offline phase. The important thing why we do this is if you want to make this pipeline meaningful, oops, if you want to make this pipeline meaningful, you should keep it green. So a pipeline that is red all the time will easily be ignored by your people. So it loses value. Yeah? People start working around it. If the monitor is red, they don't care because it's red all the time. Yeah? Happened last time it, or worked last time and it was red, will work this time and it's red. But this is not what a pipeline is for. This is not what gives you the confidence that if things actually work as expected. So keeping your pipeline green is a very important part of continuous integration. And having those local offline tests help you as a quality gate so that shit doesn't get in the pipeline at all, okay? Cool, then we have this build stage. I hope I explained this before. It's wrapping all your things together in an archive so that you have this one package that you can pass through the 
environments and with every environment gaining more and more confidence that your code works as expected. Tools we usually use there are again TFLIN for, uh, for the syntax check, this time in the pipeline. Uh, we talked about those offline testing tools before. Again, you can use open policy to open policy agent to prevent resources from being created that your company doesn't allow. There is another funny tool that I want to mention, Auras. Who of you knows Auras? I didn't know it until last week, but what you can do with it, and that is really funny, you can put anything you want into an open container image. Open container image is this thingy that Docker uses to storage images. And once you have this in this format, you can push it into any container registry. So you don't need any storage for those artifacts. You can use a default container registry to store those things immediately, OK? That's what ORAS is for. Stack tests change. Now it becomes a little bit more interesting. Uh, who have no use knows TerraTest? OK, TerraTest is a framework uh, that's written in Go, which you can use to test Terraform uh, code. Um, it's a bit tricky to use, I have to admit. So my first attempt to use it, I didn't really like it because Go is very verbose compared to other languages like Python. Uh, but still, it helps you a lot to spin up those things and does a lot of the grunt work and the bootstrapping. And you can actually focus on the tests. Uh, in this stage, we apply the changes and we test against the actually provisioned um, resources in the cloud. Integration test takes then this package and provisions it into a pre-production stage. This is something that you might develop against or that you might use for uh, user acceptance testing or sending out previews to your, to your customers. And this is the stage where you can also validate the user journey. Like I mentioned before, here you can check whether user login still works or your database can be connected, all those things. And last but not least, we have the production stage. And I think what's important here is, if you rem remember the Swiss cheese model, in the production stage, you want to make sure that you can detect problems before you, your users do, right? So good tools for that are things like synthetic monitoring, where you repeat a certain part of a user journey in a monitoring tool, like Datadog or whatever you use, and constantly repeat certain checks uh, that check the basic health of your application website, whatever you deploy there. And to summarize this concept, um, you take one code base, pass it through a local test, then build this archive I mentioned, which is the package on, on the bottom. And then you, what we say, promote this package from stage to stage, adding confidence in each stage that your infrastructure code is actually doing what you want. And one important step that allows you to do this is having small stacks finding good boundaries for your stacks, and factoring out the configuration from the actual infrastructure code. Okay? If you follow those steps, uh, building a pipeline around this will be fairly easy. Okay? We skipped that. Let's talk a little bit about challenges. This is another quote from a team chat that we copied last week, um, referring to the stack size. 2,500 cloud resources in one Terraform stack, not a good idea. OK, slice it down. So challenge is find good boundaries. Try to slice it down as much as possible. Small is beautiful. Second challenge, blast radius. So basically, you can differentiate between two types of cloud resources, those that don't have state and those that have state. And those that have state are the evil, OK? A database accidentally deleted is a mess even if you have a backup. Yeah? Anything that you need to carefully configure after you provision it, and this configuration is, is kind of a state that you have to keep from, from version to version, is tricky, it will become a problem if it, if it goes down accidentally. And again, the idea is reduce the blast radius by finding small slices through your infrastructure to reduce the impact of things go wrong. And whenever possible, uh, use stateless resources. Okay? This is a very abstract but general advice. Extending this, um, who of you is deploying their application in containers? Cool, cool, cool. Cool, cool, cool. 
I, but it would be nice to see more hands up. So what is the great thing about containers when it comes to deployment? It's that you always start greenfield. There is no running server where you have to ansible some configuration flags and provision some templated files to certain places, then pray and hope that things work at the end. There is just a container executor, whatever this is. It doesn't need to be Kubernetes, don't get me wrong. And then you have this image that you can test long before you bring it into production. You can even spin it up on your local workstation, right? And this image will completely replace what's in place before. There is no incremental updates anymore. And that, for me, is one of the, yeah, the things about containerizing your, your workload. Now, when you compare this to what happens with infrastructure deployment, it's more something like this. You always have a, a previous state and add some changes on top. And the tricky thing when it comes to automation is that, first of all, if you want to confidently <laughs> deploy version 2, you need to have version 1 in place and see whether this delta works. That is tricky if deploying version 2 in your pipeline fails in the middle. <laughs> because then you have this undefined state between version 1 and version 2, and the confidence that a deployment that worked in staging still works in production gets significantly lower, okay? So that's, that's a tricky thing, and it, it's, it's even worse than that. I do a fast forward because this also impacts your ability for disaster recovery. Because what you do all the time is only applying those incremental changes. You have this very well automated. But what happens if everything is gone? Can you then still come to the latest state in one go? Remember, you never did that before. You only did the small things, right? But what happens if the small things are no longer there? So this means even with an automation in place that helps you to go from one version to the other, you should regularly check whether this disaster recovery still works. An approach for that might be to tear down your whole stack every weekend and try to spin it up again with the latest version of your code. You can have really bad surprises when you do that. We, we faced things you couldn't imagine. Like One example is cloud providers keeping alive a certain API of a resource, but only for the old versions. So this means if you delete this old version and spin up a new one, your interface might be gone because it's no longer supported. It worked all the time with those incremental changes because you always had those old versions in place. But once you delete it, it will no longer work. And you can only detect it with this measure of tearing down everything regularly and trying to recreate it, because this will then uncover such issues. Talking about some other issues, uh, who of you is using something like canary deployment or blue-green deployment for your applications? Cool, you do a lot of fancy stuff there. We need to talk. Cool, okay, so what you do with blue-green is you have an old version running, you spin up a new version in parallel, redirect some of the traffic to the new version, see whether it works, and only then reroute everything to the new version, okay? It's a cool concept because it gives you really a lot of confidence that your application is working as expected. But it's not so easy with infrastructure. Again, imagine you have version 1 of your database and version 2 of your database. <laughs> you cannot easily redirect some of the traffic to your database into the new version by still having the old version in place. At least that requires a significant amount of work and maybe a very expensive database system. Okay? So databases are my favorite example of things that can go wrong. Another thing is, again, the feedback cycle. So this is an actual screenshot from an infrastructure deployment pipeline we used at a customer. And you can see that the average runtime was around 18 minutes. So I think it's fine if it works after 18 minutes, but imagine an average patient developer who waits for 18 minutes and then sees that this pipeline is red <laughs> and then has to wait for another 18 minutes. Yeah, what do people tend to do? They start working around. I can apply this locally. Fuck the pipeline, yeah? 
And this is something you don't want to have. And again, the, the, the default measure to, to fix this problem is slice down your stack. Okay? Cool. This being said, we come to the summary. If you remember one thing from this talk, I would say remember one code base per stack, factor out the configuration, and promote this code base through your environments. Okay? This is uh, a very generic approach. You can apply to whatever infrastructure framework you use and will allow you to easily create those pipelines and will be an important step to automation. And that's it. Thank you. Um, I don't think I oversold how good of a teacher you are. You. I was always one of those developers that was very happy to stay far and wide away from anything in infrastructure, and I got all of that. Ooh. So that's on you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, we do have some questions from the audience. Um, one of them anonymous, the other one not anonymous. Sebastian K. from Dresden wants to know... <laughs> Would you always recommend a cloud, or are there scenarios where you prefer on-premise or quote-unquote classical infrastructure? Huh. You know, I work for consultancy, and the default answer we give for that is, it depends. <laughs> but it doesn't help you. So, For the sake of Sebastian, would you elaborate? Looking at my past career, I would say my joy of working with infrastructure significantly increased at the moment I was allowed to use cloud infrastructure. And there might be reasons why you don't want to do this, but to be honest, most of the reasons I heard in my career didn't hold. So often it's things like costs, security, privacy issues, uh, you trust uh, the American companies, AWS is evil, all this, yeah. Um, at the end, I think what you should keep in mind is you want to support your business. And it's not about keeping a department up and running and um, making use of the people you have managing your data centers. It's the question, how can you best support this business? And yeah, there are, there are a variety of, of cloud offerings nowadays. And I don't say go to AWS or go to Azure or go to GCP. Those are the only things you can use. Um, there are a lot of alternatives to that, but I would hesitate working on infrastructure that does not provide this, at least the basic level of automation that we nowadays get from cloud infrastructure. Yeah. You could bring your business in a questionable situation. That would be my take. So consider very carefully whether the business benefits of running on-prem really outweigh the potential negative aspects and, and make a, bis a business decision and not um, a decision in favor of the preference of, of some people. Let's put it like that. I hope this helps. I don't know, but I can't sure try to be more specific. I'm here yeah. to tell us if he's happy with that um, answer, yeah. but I'm sure he'll watch the recording and give you feedback. We have another question? One more? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so the question is if you can give an example of slicing the stacks, like you stressed very much that, that you should keep mm. the stack small, mm. so it would be interesting to yep. get a real-world example. It's a super good, exam uh, super good question. I tried to elaborate on that a bit more before, and then I forgot. So there are certain criteria that you might consider when, when slicing those stacks. So one criteria is, for, for example, permission boundaries. Right? So I showed this example of the underlying network. <laughs> This is a thing that even with all the abstraction built around it is still tricky to do right and can create really big security holes, for example, if you set up if done wrong. So you might restrict the group of people who have direct access to change this. This is what we mean with permission boundaries. So looking at those, let's say, easily security relevant things, might be one consideration to slice those things. Another consideration might be the life cycle of changes. 
I said that before. Uh, usually when you provision cloud infrastructure, you think about a networking concept, and this remains pretty stable. So you only change it a few times, if at all, okay? So this frequency of changes might be another indication of what are good boundaries for, for my slices. Um, yet another boundary might be the, the application built on top. So what we usually see, we have some foundation stacks. This could be the networking, monitoring, uh, the Kubernetes cluster that is shared. And then you have on top of that some uh, microservices, each maintained by individual teams. And you want to uh, slice the stacks in such a way that each team can maintain their piece of the cake on, on, the, on the upper layer of abstraction, which is uh, the microservice provisioning. And then again, this, this would be a really good slicing also in terms of reuse, because um, if you do it right, you might have similar technology for each of the microservices, so they have a very similar stack, if not the same stack at all. So the best, the best setup I ever worked in, it was deploying a new service was changing five uh, attributes in the YAML file, literally five attributes. And with that, you could deploy an application with uh, key clock uh, authentication, with uh, certificate uh, encryption, and everything on, on a Kubernetes cluster. So this could be like a target picture to make uh, the usage of the infrastructure really simple for your development teams. Hope this answers the question. Okay, right, cool. right, thank we have you. One more question from the audience, and we're running a little short on time, but I'd feel bad leaving out questions. Um, what about saving cost by using serverless scale to zero and shared databases, et cetera? Ooh, good question, apparently. I don't know. Very good question, so, apparently. Saving costs, yes, saving costs is a point. Um, I think it, it depends a bit on the scale of your project. There can be very valid use cases for, for serverless uh, approaches. I never use them in production. That's why I say I don't know. Um, one thing why we stepped back a little bit after the initial hype around serverless is that it can easily become a nightmare to manage them. So you have those very, very, very many small pieces that n still somehow need to fit together, and you might have to put a significant amount of effort in this orchestration. And I heard that from other teams that this can easily become a nightmare if you don't pay attention here. On the other hand, yes, of course, you, you reduce the, the infrastructure that you need to maintain to the maybe smallest minimum, right? Does this answer one, the question? Sorry. I have one more correction. I am an international cheese expert. Cool. I do not limit myself to Swiss cheese. Cool, 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 cool. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.